Denmark has seen The 13th, the 13th plenary me a meeting of Habitat, United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, is called to order. Uh, we shall now continue with the general debate. The first speaker this morning is the President of the Central Authority of Town Planning and Habitat of Afghanistan, His Excellency Dr. A. Wasi Basharyar, to whom I invite to the rostrum. Monsieur le Président, distingué délégué, je suis très heureux. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I'm most happy to be among you in a major world conference where we're meeting to have an exchange of views on one of the fundamental needs of man, habitat. The delegation of Afghanistan, which I have the honor to head, is most grateful to Mr. Enrique Peñalosa, the Secretary General, and to the Government of Canada for their invitation. Mr. President, habitat is a fundamental need and right of people. I am therefore very happy that this gathering is taking place in Vancouver in so gracious and hospitable a setting. This is a follow-up of the 1972 Stockholm Conference, but and in the meantime, several international gatherings were held to discuss the problem of human settlements. I would mention the one in Athens in 1967 under Le Corbusier. The problem of human settlements has therefore been debated several times, but we have never before roused world public opinion. One of the wishes of the urbanists and architects is now achieved. We are having a worldwide discussion by politicians. And whatever the policy on human settlements, it is the political choices which determine their actual realization. Mr. President, since time immemorial, men have tried to improve their living conditions. Kind has achieved enormous progress in many fields, but uh, in regard to human settlements, the situation is far from satisfactory. Sociological research shows that most men do not have suitable housing. Habitat is not a shelter. It is the center of a person's life, which must meet all individual and collective needs. We must point out that urbanization flowing from industrialization and the population growth means that we must face a new set of realities. Namely, we must build entire districts in a few months and cities in a few years. And it is to this I wish to draw your attention. To build much in a short time does not mean that we must build haphazardly. We must build in a manner that is, will meet the needs of people and avoid the degradation of nature, pollution, and all the other alarming consequences. In the case of savage urbanization, we get mere shanty towns and slums. And this is exactly what the Secretary General mentioned, lack of hospital schools and social services as well as drinking water, electricity, and telephone services. 
We must preserve a natural framework and create suitable housing with appropriate equipment and amenities. Another point which seems to me to be most important is where do men live? 60% live in rural environments, which means that most of our, the inhabitants of our planet are concerned with rural living. So our efforts must be concentrated on improving the way of life of the rural population, particularly because they live in difficult conditions. It is likewise true that in the present process of development, the rural population tends to decline, but this will not go to the infinite. The, it is an injustice to have disinherited rural populations with no organization while the cities are highly organized. We must therefore create the balance d'une politique d'aménagement régional voire aménagement du territoire. Monsieur le président, notre pays Afghanistan se trouve au cœur de l'Asie. C'est un pays habité depuis des millénaires par des hommes. Donc l'histoire des villes afghanes remonte à plus de 2500 ans. L'Afghanistan est étendu sur 650 000 km² à 17 millions d'habitants, dont 2 millions sont des nomades. Le taux d'accroissement de sa population est de 2,4%, ce qui montre que sa population sera doublée en 29 ans. La croissance démographique des deux dernières décennies, non suivie d'une croissance économique correspondante, est à l'origine du problème de l'habitat dans le pays. La population afghane est constituée de 85% de population euh, rurale et de 15% de population urbaine. Nous avons une cinquantaine de villes et le reste de la population vit dans les 16 338 villages. Vu la densité de la population afghane, 26 habitants au kilomètre carré, il existe dans notre pays de grands sur... 26 persons per square kilometer. We have large habitable areas, but the problem is to create favorable living conditions. So we need vital space, namely land for agriculture and livestock. We have thousands of hectares for agriculture, but they lack water. The first solution is to develop these arable lands where millions of farmers could live in better conditions. The second problem in Afghanistan is derived from the three aspects of its population, urban, rural, and nomads. The urban population is growing. The rate of growth in Kabul is 5%. For the other Afghan cities, it is 4%. The growth rate of cities in the developed countries is well known, but in the third world countries, and in particular in Afghanistan, this is a problem that is now emerging. But it is very serious, because we have a slow construction rate, and the old dwelling units require constant repairs. Because of a lack of housing, isolated houses are spontaneously built. This chaos increases the cost of the infrastructure and superstructure. Secondly, the rural population, it is declining slightly as in all countries. But the needs of habitat in Afghanistan are really the needs of the rural population. The conditions of life and of health are rather poor. We, the situation is the reason for many epidemics and diseases. Therefore, to improve the life and health of the rural inhabitants, we must improve their habitat. Third, the nomads. One of the characteristics of our population is the presence of two million nomads. Their way of life differs according to their occupation, whether they are agricultural, uh, masons, tradesmen, in which case they build tents. But they, too, are entitled to habitat and education so that their progressive achievement of a sedentary way of life is a necessity, and I hope that this conference will find solutions for. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, the problems of habitat in Afghanistan having been mentioned, I nevertheless wish to mention that the government 
is making a constant effort to improve human settlements. There is a central service for urban planning where plans are drawn up which are drawn up on the spot with local authorities. We have a research institute of building materials so as to adapt them to the physical and economic conditions of each locality. We have two state enterprises and scores of private enterprises and a prefabricated factory with a capacity of 35,000 square meters which build dwellings. When there is a danger of earthquake or floods, the government has a radical solution. And because of the assistance of friendly countries and of international organizations, we have a double action, short-term action, which is to build new houses, and a long-term plan to build housing which will resist earthquakes and floods. The government has set up agrarian reform whereby thousands of hectares are distributed free or at low cost to nomads, to poor farmers. And for the, their human settlements, we need experts and capital. I hope that the United Nations and the Habitat Secretariat will assist us. Mr. President, forward. The habitat situation will depend on the economic situation in each country. There must be a redistribution of wealth and income. Hence, international solidarity and brotherhood are required. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, millions who are living in very difficult conditions have their eyes set on us. They expect a great deal from this conference. They expect concrete results to their problems. The delegation of Afghanistan and our government are prepared to contribute to the success of this conference. I conclude by expressing the hope that we might forget for a minute where we come from and simply think of ourselves as citizens of the earth. We have the same problems and we must love each other and unite for the good and well-being of mankind. Capsule, please. Afghanistan, land of mountains, high deserts and fertile river valleys. Afghanistan needs more large irrigation projects, but in the meantime the people help themselves. Each year they build temporary dams to draw water into their irrigation ditches and canals. And each year too they work together to maintain those canals. So much of the land is dry that over the centuries the people have developed many ways to irrigate their fields. To the people, water is so precious that as it runs out to the fields, each farmer's share is measured in seconds. The farmers that live always with the prospect of hardship and suffering are those that work the hot, dry steps and mountain slopes. Their fields get as little as 20 centimeters of rain a year. The government is trying to help the people with large-scale irrigation projects. Wheat is the staple food, and one of the government's basic goals is to produce all the wheat and other foods the people need. Wherever water can be brought to the fields, the land will yield rich harvests, 
and more and more produce is now being exported. The landlocked country has from ancient times been the crossroads of trade and culture on the overland routes between East and West. As Afghanistan moves out of the glorious past, it is trying to improve the lives of all the people. There are nearly 17 million people in Afghanistan, and about 2 million are nomads. The government is trying to encourage them to settle permanently by granting them land. That way, their health conditions will improve and their children will be educated. Some nomads are well off. The traders, herdsmen, and producers of handicrafts. But many are poor and depend on finding casual work on farms or in cities. Almost all homes in rural areas are built of mud and sun-dried bricks. But they cost only $50, and if looked after, can last 60 years. One of the biggest problems is providing safe drinking water for everyone. Traditional sources, canals and wells, are often contaminated, leading to disease and occasional epidemics. So, in villages and in cities, the government has many water projects underway. Overcrowding in the cities, especially Kabul, is another major problem. Sometimes, several families share one small house. Under these pressures, it is all too easy for slums to develop. Through its town planning and housing departments, and by using modern building methods, such as prefabricated concrete panels, the government is providing cheaper housing for the people. Although the problems facing Afghanistan are so many, the government is confident that with the help of the people, it can work towards a better life for everyone in the country. I thank the presidents of the Central Authority of, of Town Planning and Habitat of Afghanistan. Before calling on the next speaker, I wish to give the floor to Mr. Kurda for a technical announcement. Mr. Kurda, please. Thank you, Mr. President. It's just to inform that uh, the English translation this morning has been switched from Channel 4 to Channel 2. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kurda. I now give the floor to the Minister of Housing and Environment of Denmark, His Excellency Mr. Helge Nielsen. Herr Formen. Mr. President, in my dual capacity as Danish Minister of the Environment and of Housing, I wish on behalf of the Danish government to congratulate the president on his election and to express my warm thanks to the Canadian government for hosting this conference, to the United Nations for having convened it, and to Mr. Peñalosa, the secretary general and his staff for having so skillfully prepared it. We view this conference not only in the light of the general efforts to promote international cooperation and understanding, but also as a significant conference in itself. Because even if international cooperation has brought valuable results in the field of human settlements, as is the theme of this conference, there is obviously still a long way to go. 
field of the environment, housing, physical planning, or in other fields within the broad terms that we call human settlements. Several speakers have already pointed out that the unequal distribution of wealth, as well as the economic conditions and structure in each individual country, are decisive factors in determining overall endeavors to create a better quality of life for people of all nations. I assume it is needless to say that I fully share this general viewpoint. On the other hand, although it is obvious that the quality of human settlements and of the man-made environments depend to a high degree on the economic conditions internationally as well as nationally, we must realize that the human settlement problem contains specific elements which can be discussed separately. This conference, and this I should like to underline, should, in my opinion, single out these elements and seek conclusions and recommendations as to how they can be applied to the benefit of human and social welfare and with due respect for our limited natural resources. When here we can discuss human settlements, while at the same time the problems of world economy and distribution of wealth are discussed elsewhere, this stems from the fact that human settlement problems are mainly national problems. They contain specific aspects and facets in each country, and it is up to each country to put the human settlement problems in a proper place on the list of priorities. Even if a country does face a heavy burden of economic problems, it may still be able to take measures with the view to creating a sound basis for a human settlement policy. Legislation regulating utilization and development of land and an effective administration of such legislation may form that basis. It might secure reasonable and adequate use of resources by systematic distribution of land, which is the fundamental element for urban development. It may also make possible the extraction of resources, underground resources, as well as the development of agriculture, forestry, and other well-defined activities and thus prevent many erroneous and costly investments which are only too well known to the industrialized countries and at the same time prevent environmental hazards and pollution. The economic potential of a country will of course dictate the rate of development within a given planning framework, but once you, the framework is established, guide, development can be guided along physical lines compatible with man's needs and desires. It is the challenge to all countries to overcome traditional resentment against planning or against giving up privileges inherited from the past. A housing and settlement policy should be given high priority when planning for a fair distribution of the national income among citizens. It is possible for countries other than the highly developed countries to pursue an efficient housing policy. Governments should coordinate their housing policy with a planned mobilization of the resources available in the population by enlisting the participation of citizens. For instance, in the form of cooperative or aided self-help methods, valuable results may be obtained. And by pursuing such a policy, one of the objectives of this conference will be fulfilled, namely, involvement of individual citizens in solving their own housing problems. By making housing policy a central issue when distributing existing economic resources, 
governments undertake a major responsibility, and not least in the developing countries where a majority of their population lives on extremely limited means. This demands that the utmost importance be attached to the problem of supply and the price of land. Everybody at this conference who is familiar with the building industry is aware that the amount of developed land available and its price are decisive in the cost of housing. It is therefore appropriate that the question of land be given a central role in the recommendations for national action to be drafted at this conference. From the point of view of Denmark, we can certainly see the advantage in charging public authorities with providing developed land for construction. But the Danish experience shows, on the other hand, that reasonable prices can be obtained on the open market provided all land is subject to systematic physical planning. Uh, there are added economic benefits from selling land in Denmark since they are subject to heavy taxation so that the profits are recaptured by the public. In Denmark, we have reached a comparatively high standard of housing. We seek to leave room for individual ways of life and forms of settlement. That this attitude may well cause problems is what we have tried to show in our demonstration project, Houses and People. It is the point of view of Denmark that a human settlement policy can be based on a number of general principles that we expect will be endorsed by this conference as a starting point for general improvements in this field. These general principles could also constitute the basis for an exchange of information and experiences. I consider this conference to be important but not exclusive in solving the problems we face. Denmark will therefore continue to give high priority to international cooperation in the fields of housing and planning as part of our program of cooperation with developing countries. The rules of procedure of the conference leaves me the possibility of showing a capsule of one of the Danish demonstration projects, and I have chosen urban development in harmony with the open land. I hope that this short presentation will serve to underline my remarks about the necessity of planning as an absolute must before embarking on the development of human settlements. Thank you. Capsule, please. In harmony with the open land. A Danish contribution to Habitat 1976. Denmark has seen and will continue to see a rapid urban growth. It's expected that about 500 square kilometers of land will be required for urban development in the next 15 years. Planning serves a dual purpose. To leave areas free from new development and to secure a phased urban expansion. As early as in 1949, legislation was enacted in Denmark to regulate urban growth. The Urban and Rural Zones Act divides the country into two types of zone, rural zones and urban zones. Rural zones account for 90% of the total area of Denmark. Building is allowed only in connection with farming and forestry activities. Urban zones are intended for town building, residential housing, industrial plants, office buildings, and the establishment of all the other elements of town formation. Land is earmarked for urbanization on the basis of regional assessment, and urban expansion is regulated by local planning. Urban zones shall at any time be large enough to cover building and other urban growth needs for the forthcoming years. 
development covering sewerage, roads and water supply shall be completed before building is started. By the Urban and Rural Zones Act, Denmark has ensured in a simple manner that practically all building and use of land will be regulated by careful physical planning to determine the best locations for building. The Act has ensured a phased development of many towns and provided for the establishment of green belts. The Act has helped to preserve areas for farming, forestry and other rural pursuits. It has also helped to leave large tracts of land free for recreational and for unpredictable future purposes. I thank the Minister of Housing and Environment of Denmark. The next speaker is the Minister for Local Administration of Swaziland, His Royal Highness Prince Masisela Dalaimini. I give him the floor now. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, Mr. President, I would like on behalf of my delegation to join those who have spoken before me in congratulating you warmly on your election as president of this historic conference. May I further congratulate the Canadian federal government, the provincial authorities, and the city of Vancouver on this splendid arrangement that they have made for this conference. The first major United Nations conference held outside a national capital or headquarters. I'm sure that under your guidance, this conference would be brought to a successful conclusion. On behalf of my delegation, I wish to express my appreciation for being given the opportunity of addressing this first and important conference on human settlements. Before I go on, however, I would like to convey to this conference and to the Secretariat of Habitat the good wishes and felicitations of His Majesty, King Sobuza II of Swaziland. The Kingdom of Swaziland lies in the southeastern part of Africa, it is a small landlocked country of about 17,000 square kilometers with a population of half a million people. The population of the kingdom is estimated to double itself in the year 200. At present, the average density of population is 30 persons per square kilometer. Whilst the present modest population of Swaziland does not pause very complicated problems. Those that exist require to be solved and steps are being taken now to deal with the future growth of its population. Since most of the people in the Kingdom of Swaziland live in the rural areas as subsistence farmers and since Swaziland is unlikely for some time to come to be seriously afflicted by the deleterious effects of pollution from industrial complexes, rural development has therefore assumed an important element in the kingdom's current development plan, which emphasizes self-help projects. The rural dweller of Swaziland suffers from lack of basic amenities, such as modern housing and transportation facilities. And it is here that one is faced with the grim realities of the afflictions of poverty. 
the farmer suffers from the serious impact of the jewel economy, which colonialism introduced into Swaziland. He is less educated and cannot adapt his way of life to increase his productivity so that even efforts by extension workers and chiefs are not bearing the fruits we all expect. His way of life, which revolves around his livestock, has led to serious overgrazing and soil erosion. A start has been made to reorientate the Swazi farmer and to enable him to adopt new techniques, but there is yet a lot to be done. The depressed state of the environment in the rural areas has led to migration from the rural areas to the urban centers where the immigrant has encountered serious indignities of shortage of housing, slum dwellings under overcrowded conditions and lack of basic amenities. The government of the Kingdom of Swaziland realizes the importance of rural housing projects which make use of local materials and which are within the range of the rural population. The construction of conventional housing has been found to be too expensive in terms of the limited resources of the present and future rural population. The government is also engaged in the recycling of the widely scattered farming communities. In this scheme, it is intended to explore the use of local materials for the construction of adequate dwellings to centralize modern social, educational, and cultural amenities such as schools, health, and recreational facilities, and to promote small-scale and allied industries improved irrigation and farming methods and other skills. It is hoped that these would help to increase the income of the rural population, achieve higher standards of living, prevent the widening gap between the modern and traditional sectors of the economy and between the urban and rural communities and stem the flow of the population from the rural areas to the two main urban areas, which are, of course, very overcrowded. To spread the drip into a great number of areas, special incentives are being offered to investors to establish hotels and other industrial activities in the smaller sectors. I would like to emphasize, Mr. President, the role of our natural resources in our development, for the human and the material and the means wherewith all these resources could be used to uplift the nation. I believe that a solution to the whole question of our natural resources will provide the vehicle that would, in the end, emancipate our nation and provide the kind of life we wish for ourselves and our children. A determined effort to achieve sovereignty over our natural resources and a complete rethinking of our educational system are necessary in Swaziland if Swaziland is to escape from the pollution of poverty. The concerns of the Kingdom of Swaziland are the provision of the basic human needs necessary for the attainment of a decent standard of living for its peoples, such as basic adequate health services, infrastructure, housing, food, and suitable educational facilities. My delegation, Mr. President, hopes that the solution of some of the problems of human settlements that face the Kingdom of Swaziland would emerge during the proceedings of this conference. My delegation would also be grateful for such assistance that governments and organizations represented here may be in a position to give to the Kingdom of Swaziland in its efforts to tackle the problems of human settlement. 
Finally, Mr. President, distinguished delegates, allow me to conclude my express, by expressing the sincere wish of my delegation that the goals of this conference be realized and that its spirit be kept burning long after the Vancouver conference. We applaud its heroic task of tackling the problems of human settlement, which have for so long been neglected. Every one of us shall leave the warm and hospitable Canadian having enriched ourselves with not only the cross-cultural experience, but also having learned from one another various ways of solving the human problems. The solution-orientated approach, Mr. President, has been a shot in the arm in stimulating our commitment to face squarely the task of human settlement. Throughout our national preparation seminar in Swaziland for this conference, we have witnessed the dedication and the will from the people of Swaziland to remedy the situation. Problems and solutions have been well articulated in the august body by able exponents that preceded me. My delegation, Mr. President, has learned a great deal what remains for us all is to translate into immediate action what we have learned in this past week. I'm sure we, we shall come out of this experience with better perspective of how to actively address ourselves to destitute humanity. We in Swaziland, Mr. President, shall do our part as you will see from the capsule, and we sincerely hope that the international community will be of assistance in supplementing our limited resources. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished delegates, for your attention. Capsule, please. Swaziland in the southeastern part of Africa. In one part of the country, a dry area needs a water catchment reservoir, and it's built by the community on a self-help basis. The work is being done under government supervision, one of the many diverse projects destined to improve the quality of life in rural areas of Swaziland. Rural development means young people will stay on the farm and not flock to urban areas, creating congestion and slums. In another part of the country, farmers' homesteads have traditionally been distant from each other, widely scattered over a great area. Now the government promotes resettlement, grouping farmers together into communities where they can share health and education facilities and cooperate economically. At first, individualistic farmers were reluctant to work together, but soon the profitable results of cooperation became evident, such as a much lower price for fertilizer when they pooled their resources and bought large quantities. Extensive irrigation projects have been an important part of rural development schemes, and the introduction of new crops has also been featured. Resettled farmers are provided with new skills, such as the raising of poultry. This can mean an important source of additional income. There is also an emphasis on dairy farming, with women taking an important role in this. And the government has obtained high-quality bulls for the improvement of the breed. In the Northeast, elaborate irrigation works serve a growing area where resettled farmers are provided with houses and fields where they can grow sugar cane. New mechanized methods are being introduced and these will lead to an expansion of Swaziland's sugar industry 
and exports. Education plays a vital role in rural development. Besides grade schools, there are classes in homemaking for women, and clinics have been established. Facilities like these were unavailable to widely scattered farm families before resettlement. Small enterprises like this carpenter shop, where furniture is made, are an important part of Swaziland's rural development program. The goal being the diversification of local economies. In this workshop, people get on-the-job training. Swaziland has rich natural resources, but farmers live in isolated pockets. Thus, it is difficult to bring them modern amenities, health care, education. But resettlement in larger communities seems to offer the answer, a much better answer than letting people flock to the cities to create congestion and slums. I thank the Minister for Local Administration of Swaziland. I will not fail to transmit to the President your congratulations and good wishes, sir. I now give the floor to the President of the National Planning Board of Ecuador, His Excellency Mr. Alfonso Arcos. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the government and people of Ecuador are participating in this conference with enormous interest as it deals with one of the most critical problems, the deterioration of the quality of life in human settlements. It is the conviction of my country that this conference will have far-reaching repercussions in the history of mankind, both because of the principles which it upholds, as well as because of its profound human content. Ecuador has firmly contributed to strengthening international cooperation mechanisms and the peace and solidarity among peoples. To this end, with genuine conviction, we have given support to every constructive effort to attain a reasonable degree of well-being for peoples and human beings. Sensitive as we are to the aspirations of the third world of which we are a part, we have set a clear policy of protection and use of our natural resources. And consequently endorsed any action which reflects the free exercise of sovereignty in respect of the ownership, use, and management of natural resources and national economic activities. I refer to this important part of international relations, which has been endorsed by the world community because without the ex effective exercise of this right, people, the beginning and the end of the hope which unites us today, will not find the ways to improve their way of life and therefore human settlements. Accordingly, my country rejects any attitudes contrary to this inalienable right because they are coercive and are a threat to our peoples. So then, Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I have a serious concern about any vacuum which might arise after our deliberations. If people and human settlements are not linked to, their, to the use of their natural resources, it is only in this way that our peoples will find genuine freedom, which will enable them to start to genuine social and economic development by a proper use of the environment. In this perspective, 
I consider that unless firm steps are taken to implement the principles and the actions which will emerge from this conference, we shall be criticized by present and future generations. Since the degree of dependence of our peoples at all levels will be become larger by denying them their most elementary rights. It is also essential that the spirit of Vancouver reach all confines of the world so as to create awareness among all population groups that it is they who must manage their own destinies and emphasize to governments the urgency of strengthening national mechanisms and applying policies and strategies which are adequate for a planned development of human settlements within a framework of self-determination and in accordance with the requirements and the conditions in each country. Likewise, it is essential that plans and action on human settlements be multidisciplinary and multidirectional. That is to say, they must take into account the problem as a whole, as a universe in itself, by mobilizing all available resources and involving local and regional aspirations within national objectives. Every government must commit itself to meet the needs of the members of the community so that they may discharge their social function in a natural and man-made environment of the best quality. Only thus can each human being develop within a just society where everyone does his duty and exercises his rights with a quality of opportunities. On the other hand, a suitable policy for human settlements should strengthen coordination among sectorial programs in each country and at the same time allow for broader participation of population groups. Thus, community efforts would not duplicate action nor waste scarce resources. This implies a substantial revision of administrative and institutional systems to carry out this task. For my delegation, it is also clear that the problem of human settlements in developing countries cannot be resolved merely by applying alien technologies. On the contrary, we have to have special recourse to our own models which are in accord with our social, economic, political, geographical, and ecological conditions. Hence the need for systematic research to ascertain the real situation, the potential and possibilities for development. It is precisely in this field where international cooperation would be most fruitful. By training our national technical experts by an exchange of experiences among countries and channeling finances to implement integral development plans. It is thus that this conference is of the utmost value, among other reasons, by presenting audiovisual exhibits where we can objectively appreciate national efforts in regard to the critical situation of human settlements. In this connection, I applaud the Canadian proposal to establish an audio-visual library for the benefit of the world community. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, allow me briefly to indicate the nature of the problems in my country in regard to human settlements and the efforts made to solve them. The details are analyzed in the report national report which was submitted to the Secretary General of Habitat. In Ecuador, the structure of human settlements is imbalanced. 25% of the population 
and 80% of economic activities and basic services are concentrated in its main cities. The remainder of the population lives in a few small cities and in many scattered rural settlements which are badly distributed over the land and have insufficient communications. Therefore, the priority which Ecuador gives to the social aspects of the community is strengthened by rural and local development programs within a regional strategy which endeavors to attain a more balanced distribution of the population and the resources. Subject to the integral plan of transformation and development, the government of Ecuador is preparing the basic studies for the regionalization of our national territory and an integrated development approach covering our area. We thereby intend to lessen the marked existing differences between urban and rural areas and among the various regions of the country. In anticipation of this policy, we have initiated two major projects. One of local development intended to solve the intrinsic problems of settlements from the village to the metropolis, and another policy of rural development intended mainly to raise the standard of living of the rural communities of the country, which represent more than 50% of the population. In the rural development program, we have raised incentives to agriculture, which is the predominant economic activity in Ecuador, so as to increase employment sources, raise the standards of income of the rural population, and ensure a better quality of life for the rural population, so as to lessen the exodus to the cities. One of the audiovisual presentations of Ecuador entitled Human Settlements and Development clearly shows the efforts we're making to solve these problems. On the other hand, the concern of the government of Ecuador in regard to the quality of the environment has been reflected in the establishment of as a secretariat of environmental protection which carries out programs to provide drinking water, recycling solid wastes, and sewage. We also have a law for the protection and control of the environment which will be basic to regulate the rational use of the resources of the country. We also have other programs, such as agrarian reform and settlement, which are intended to lessen human pressure on arable soil in the areas of the greatest concentration of people and give access to the land to marginal groups. Likewise, we are planning and implementing plans to establish and maintain national parks green belts, as well as for the protection and exploitation of forestry. The audiovisual exhibit with the title Wise Use of the Environment reflects this policy. The housing situation, as in other countries of the third world, is critical. More than a third of the population lacks housing which meets the minimum living requirements. In recent years, the government has set up the necessary mechanisms and invested vast amount of resources to try to halt the housing deficit. But this effort is still insufficient and we must encourage more participation by communities for a gradual resolution of this grave problem. 
finally, in order to provide planned human settlements, we have started administrative action at the existing institutions so as to set up a centralized system to take decision and plan general policies. But it would be decentralized in regard to action and direct participation by the community. In conclusion, Mr. President, I wish to express the gratitude of the delegation of Ecuador to the people and government of Canada for the gracious hospitality we are enjoying during this conference. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the President of the National Planning Board of Ecuador. The next speaker is the Minister uh, of Municipalities of the Libyan Arab Republic, His Excellency Mr. Mufta Kaiba, to whom I now give the floor. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, we indeed feel most appreciative for the great efforts which have been deployed in preparing for this conference and which are continue, constantly uh, being exerted for all the parties concerned. It also gives me great pleasure to express uh, my sincerest thanks to the Government of Canada for hosting this important conference and for all the preparations it has made to this effect. It also gives me pleasure and it gives the pleasure of my delegation who are participating here in the works of this conference to exchange our experience and know